In this video, we will discuss the difference between the procedure and object-oriented programming paradigms. But first, what is a programming paradigm? A programming paradigm defines the working principles and the features supported by a language. It can be used to classify different programming languages. We will discuss two major programming paradigms, procedural programming and object-oriented programming, or OOP. Java, the language we will use for this course, is an object-oriented programming language. To better understand the OOP paradigm, let's first briefly discuss procedural programming. It will help us understand the limitations of procedural programming and motivations for the use of OOP. From its name, a procedure is the building block of the procedural programming paradigm. Then what is a procedure? A procedure is a set of statements that perform a specific task on input data. A procedure program consists of procedures and data. An algorithm implemented using procedural programming will have multiple procedures and data being passed between these procedures to be processed. Procedural programming paradigm is straightforward and intuitive. That's why most of the early programming languages such as C and BASIC are procedural languages. Despite its simplicity, the fact that the data and procedures are separate is one of the significant drawbacks of the procedural programming. Why? First, the data must be global so that all procedures can share and access them to do their jobs. This means that your data is not protected and each procedure can alter it in an uncoordinated way that could cause problems. Another problem is the matching between the data types and the procedure design. When you write a procedure, you assume a set of inputs with certain types and properties. If you change the data type or properties at any point, you will have to go and change every single procedure that operates on this data to account for the recent changes you made. This can be very difficult, especially for large programs with hundreds of procedures. So how do we solve this problem? The solution is to bring the data and the procedures closer to each other. This is the first concept in object-oriented programming and the focus of this course. So how does object-oriented programming work? From its name, an object is the building block of the OOP paradigm. The object is a melding of data and the procedures that operate on this data. This is how the OOP brings the data and the procedures together by encapsulating them in an object. To distinguish between OOP and the procedural paradigm, data are referred to as attributes. They are the attributes that describe the object. And procedures are referred to as methods. They are the methods that operate on the object's attributes. For the outside code to interact with an object's data, the code must do it through the object's methods. This is called data hiding, and it's crucial. Why? Well, for several reasons. First, the methods will regulate access to the data. Second, once the object entity is designed, the programmer doesn't need to worry about what goes inside the object. Instead, they only need to learn how to interact with the methods of the object. Third, if you change the attributes, you don't need to look far to locate the related methods. It's there within the object and you can easily change them. Let's take an example of an object that we use in our everyday life, a lamp. The data attributes of a lamp could be its state, on or off, and its rating in watts. We could add more attributes if we want to. Public methods are methods that the external code will deal with if they want to interact with the lamp object. It could be a switch that toggles the state attribute of the lamp or code that reads the wattage of the lamp to calculate electricity consumption. Public methods are useful and needed because they are the port through which the object interacts with the external world. Private methods are methods that are used internally by the object. In our case, it could be an internal method that will control auto switch off for the lamp if no activity detected around it to save power. Objects can survive without private methods. Since we need to think in terms of objects, this means that when we think of a problem that we want to solve, we try to decompose the problem into objects. We define the attributes and methods of each object and then make the methods of these objects interact with each other to solve the problem. Let's take a simple example. 
what if we want to have an OOP based solution for the calculation of the user's hourly pay given their number of hours worked and their gross pay? One way to think about it is to say that this user could be thought of as an object that we will refer to as an employee. The employee has three attributes, pay, hours, and rate. Of course, you could add more attributes, such as name, address, and so on. An example of a private internal method would be the method that calculates the rate based on the pay and the hours attributes. Examples of public methods would be the methods that allows configuring the pay and hours attributes by setting their values or retrieving the rate to an external code. Now we have a full description of an employee object. The next question we would ask is, what if you have a company with 10 employees and would like to maintain the information, pay, hours, and rate for each one of them? Would you go and redesign 10 different objects or would you reuse the design of a single employee object that you just invested time in designing and perfecting? The proper answer would be to reuse the code. This is what you do in OOP. Once you design and perfected an object design, what you actually build is a blueprint of this object so that you can reuse it multiple times. This blueprint is referred to as a class. So a class is the blueprint of an object and an object is an instance of the class. Once you have an employee class, you can create any number of employee objects to work with the size of your company. A good analogy of classes and objects would be the blueprint of a home. Once you have a class of homes, the blueprint, you can create as many homes, objects, from that design. They will look like each other in terms of the structure, but each one will have its unique attributes. It could be street number, color, and owner. 